Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I am David Wally, Interim President and Executive Director of the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health. I'm delighted to have you join us this evening at the 2021 FNIH Award Ceremony. This event is particularly significant for us this year as 2021 marks the 25th anniversary of FNIH's founding. Tonight, we celebrate a quarter century of successful collaboration with NIH and other federal partners, together with our private sector partners, including industry, academic institutions, nonprofit organizations, and philanthropic individuals, all working together to accelerate biomedical discoveries that improve human health and patients' lives. Most importantly, we will celebrate and recognize through three awards that we'll be bestowing this evening, the transformational work of several truly visionary biomedical scientists. You'll hear more about these achievements shortly. Before we get started, I'd like to share a few directions for viewing the FNIH award ceremony on this virtual platform. During the show, your audio will remain muted and your cameras turned off so you can focus on the presentation. You can scroll down the page to view tonight's agenda, learn about our esteemed speakers, and also find a list of our generous event sponsors. We'd love to hear from you and encourage you to stay engaged throughout the uh, evening's events. On the right side of your page, you'll see a sidebar that allows you to chat with other event attendees and ask questions. Below the chat, you'll also see our live Twitter feed with updates throughout the program. Be sure to include hashtag FNIH award ceremony on your tweets to see them come through. And finally, the program will be available to rewatch afterwards. And a recording of the event will be shared both with the attendees and those who are unable to join today. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Steve Paul, who will tell you more about tonight's program. Steve is chairman of the board of the foundation for the NIH, a post he has held since 2016. He is currently also CEO and chairman of Karuna Therapeutics, but this is only the latest post in a long and impactful career that includes significant roles with Eli Lilly and Company, Weill Cornell Medical College, and the National Institute of Mental Health. I've personally known Steve for nearly 12 years, from the time when he was the chairman of the executive committee of the Biomarkers Consortium, one of our early and very effective public-private partnerships. And so it's with great pleasure that I turn the program over to him. Welcome, Steve. Thank you, David. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. This is the first of my nine FNIH award ceremonies where I am unable to meet in person and thank all of you, our friends and colleagues who have supported the FNIH, the NIH, and our joint mission to improve the lives of patients around the world. So I salute all of you who are joining us from your homes, your offices, your labs tonight. And I offer a heartfelt wish that this time next year, we will be gathered in person as we have been in the past. Now, no matter the venue, the FNIH Ward Ceremony is and has always been a very special event where all of us who support biomedic research and the NIH join together to honor a select few of the best and brightest in our field. Tonight, the FNIH will bestow all three of our major prizes the Lurie Prize in Biomedical Sciences, the Trailblazer Prize for Clinician Scientists, and the Charles A. Sanders MD Partnership Award. Through these awards, we shine a light on women and men who have made truly groundbreaking advances in science. Leaders working together to solve some of the most vexing human health challenges of our time visionaries who re whose research paves the way for new diagnoses, treatments, and perhaps even cures. Before we move forward to introduce these individuals and their work to you, I would like to acknowledge those who have made this evening a very special event. We are delighted to have NIH Director Dr. Francis Collins here with us tonight. I'd like to take just a minute to thank Francis not only for his incredible leadership of the NIH, but his strong and unwavering support for the FNIH. 
Truth be told, many of our best ideas for public-private partnerships have come from Francis. We also welcome our former board member, uh, Anne Lurie, whose generosity and commitment to excellence in biomedical science led to the establishment of the Lurie Prize nearly a decade ago. And I extend our warmest acknowledgement and thanks to our two award ceremony co-chairs, FNIH board members, Dr. Marian Deckers and Mr. Fred Siegel, who have worked tirelessly to make this night a reality. Marian is in fact here with us now. He would like to take just a moment to acknowledge the generous support uh, and sponsors of this event. Welcome, Marian. Thank you very much, Steve. Good evening. On behalf of my fellow board members and award ceremony co-chair co Fred Siegel, I'm honored to say a few words about the vital work of the FNIH. As Dr. Paul just mentioned, the FNIH is marking the 25th anniversary this year. This milestone in itself is remarkable. Over the years, the foundation has convened and partnered with thought leaders and institutions at the forefront of biomedical research to generate new ideas, overcome obstacles, and achieve breakthroughs to help improve people's well being and save lives. That point being the FNIH shared mission with our partner in health, the NIH. Dr. Francis Collins, the NIH estimable director, has been a very key partner of the FNIH, championing our collaboration with many of the institutes and centers to advance innovation that address the greatest health challenges of our time, to accelerate development of diagnostics, of therapies, and even of cures. Those being honored tonight represent the committed scientists in biomedical research and the invaluable importance of collaboration. Now, before we move on to hearing about the exceptional work of this year's Lurie Prize winner, I would like to acknowledge the following sponsors of the 2021 award ceremony. As visionary sponsors, there are Novalis Life Sciences and Fred and Donna Siegel. Innovative sponsors, Paul and Sandra Montrand. Pioneer sponsors, Biogen, Breadwell, Cerevel Therapeutics, James Donovan, Eli Lilly, Goulston and Stores, Julie Bell Lindsay, Meridian Bioscience, Morgan Stanley, Newmark, Dr. Gil Gilbert Oman and Martha A. Darling, Quanterix, Dane Gillian Sackler, Russell Steenberg and Patricia Colbert, and Paul and Kathleen Stoffels. Thank you all for joining us tonight and for your terrific support. And now I am delighted to introduce our MC for the event, Dr. Frida Lewis Hall. During her 35th, 35 year career in medicine, Dr. Frida Lewis Hall has been on the front lines of healthcare as a clinician, educator, a researcher, and a leader in the biopharmaceuticals and life science industries, having most recently served as Pfizer's chief medical officer and executive vice president until the end of 2018, and then as chief patient officer and executive vice president in 2019. In these roles, Dr. Lewis Hall expanded outreach to patients, reshaped the focus on patient engagement and inclusion, improved health information and education, and amplified the voice of the patient within company culture and decision-making. She was responsible for the safe, effective, 
and appropriate use of Pfizer medicines and vaccines. She's also a frequent speaker on issues such as improving patient safety and health outcomes, reducing stigma and healthcare disparities, women's health, public health, and corporate leadership and diversity. Dr. Lewis Hall is a very accomplished developer of consumer education and medical outreach programs on multiple national television and radio shows and online sites. It's a pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Lewis Hall. Thank you, Marian, for that very kind introduction. I'm Dr. Frida Lewis Hall, and I'm delighted to join you this evening. It is a privilege to be here to acknowledge the accomplishments of our honorees and a special opportunity to be gathered together to hear from some of the rising leaders in science. We here this evening have long understood the importance of moving science forward. The global events of the last couple of years have provided further validation, inspiration, and incentive for this commitment. We must continue our focus on better outcomes for patients and allow our fascination with scientific discovery and a burning passion to improve lives to fuel that commitment. As a longstanding member of the FNIH board, I have been consistently impressed by the organization's 25 years of leadership and contribution in the fields of research and discovery. I am honored to be in the room with you all tonight. Let me extend a warm welcome to Dr. Zhao Wei Zhuang, winner of the 2021 Lurie Prize, and to her friends, family, colleagues, and members of her lab. We also are delighted to have with us NIH Director Dr. Francis Collins. Thank you for joining us. For nine years, the FNIH has bestowed the Lurie Prize to recognize the achievements of outstanding early career biomedical researchers. This recognition would not be possible without the generous funding provided by renowned philanthropist, Ms. Ann Laurie, here with us tonight. Ann, thank you for your steadfast commitment to the Lurie Prize over these years. Your gift has moved research forward in innumerable ways and we are grateful. We're delighted that the Lurie Prize has become one of the most prestigious awards in biomedical research. Tonight, we're excited to celebrate Dr. Zhuang as this year's Lurie Prize winner. Dr. Zhuang has revolutionized the fields of super resolution imaging and genome scale imaging. In other words, her work now allows us to see structures in the cell never viewed before. Always drawn to the visual, Dr. Zhuang and members of her lab have created a super resolution method called STORM to take us beyond the blurry images we've grown used to, unveiling clear and beautiful portraits of molecules and how they relate to one another. Moving further inward, her lab's genome scale imaging, MRFISH, can image hundreds or even thousands of genes simultaneously in individual cells, almost like a mirror image of the universe, but tiny, really tiny. As you can imagine, this has opened up all manner of potential discoveries in the field of biology that heretofore were unimaginable. And this is what Dr. Zhuang will discuss in a conversation with Francis Collins tonight. But first, I invite you to watch a short film that we made to introduce Dr. Zhuang and her science. I am a biophysicist. We develop imaging methods to study biological systems. I'm a visual person, so uh, I really like using this way of direct visualization to make discoveries. Inside the cell, there are many structures that are comparable to or smaller than the diffraction limited resolution. That means if you look at these structures under the microscopes, they look like a blur. You really cannot resolve the fine details of these structures.
STORM is a super resolution imaging method and it overcomes the diffraction limit and allow us to image with molecular scale resolution. One of the structures that we discovered in neurons is this gorgeous structure, which I call MPS, which stands for Membrane-Associated Periodic Skeleton. This is a structure that is really existing pretty much ubiquitously in all neurons. People just missed it before. Then we can just directly see the structure. MERFISH is a genome scale imaging method. My biggest fascination in applying this is for studying brain. When we look into some of these brain regions and then see the individual cells their location, you know, their organization. It's a pretty sensational feeling, you know. It feels like uh, you are peeking inside the brain, having the cell atlas, knowing what are the cell types that exist there, and uh, how they're organized uh, and how they function will just expedite our understanding of this very important organ of our body. As a scientist, I find that uh, the most rewarding thing is indeed uh, discovering the unknowns. We continue to develop genome scale imaging methods, and we continue to use MERFISH and STORM to study biological systems, and our focus is in neuroscience. I'm truly grateful to Anne Lurie and the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health for setting up this prize to honor scientists. And I think it's their vision too, to not only honor advisors, but also honor graduate students and postdocs. This prize not only recognizes the achievements we've made in the past, but more importantly, uh, it also encourages us to continue to work hard to develop more powerful methods and make more scientific discoveries to help advance science and medicine. As I mentioned earlier, we are absolutely delighted to have with us someone who needs no introduction, NIH Director Dr. Francis Collins. Francis honors us every year by leading a conversation with the Lurie Prize winner. This year is particularly special given that he has announced his decision to move beyond leadership of the NIH. A globally recognized researcher himself, Francis has a gift for shining a light on others and their contributions to science, as you will witness now. Dr. Zhuang, as the NIH director, I've been given the privilege over the past several years of being able to have a conversation uh, with the winner of the Lurie Prize. Congratulations on being this year's winner. And the work you have done is absolutely groundbreaking and fascinating. And we're going to get into talking about that a bit. The people listening to this uh, have a variety of different backgrounds, and they're not all scientists. So we'll try to be careful not to get too deeply into those uh, complicated jargon words. But people often also want to know a little bit about the prize winner in terms of what path this scientist has traveled to become so productive and have made this kind of discovery that gets recognized in this way. 
So I looked a little bit at your history and noticed, my goodness, uh, your PhD is not in biology, it's in physics. And that made me want to know, and maybe others would wonder as well, tell us a little bit about your own scientific path, how you got interested in science, and why was it physics? And then, hey, what happened after that that suddenly turned you into a biologist? Can you map out those steps for us? Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, uh, Francis, uh, thank you so much. I know you're very busy. Thank you for taking your time to do this, and I really appreciate it. And uh, as you pointed out, uh, I was trained as a physicist. And uh, how come I, uh, you know, picked physics as uh, my uh, PhD major? Uh, well, I even ever since I was a school kid, I always loved physics. You know, it's just, uh, you know, it's so simple and elegant. And then, it, you know, and then it explains, it has these simple and elegant physics laws that explains the universe. And then uh, when you learn about the subject, and then you just couldn't help appreciate the beauty of it and the elegance of it. And uh, I also like the fact that, uh, you know, I could reason things with physics. You know, I don't have to memorize a lot of facts. So uh, that makes the studying of uh, physics uh, really, uh, really appealing to me. So, so I did my uh, PhD in physics and then, uh, after that, when I was uh, uh, starting my postdoc in Steve Chu's lab, and uh, I was just ready to do something new. And then, and then I, I told Steve that, and then I said, uh, you know, how about we try something new? And I don't know what that new thing is. And then Steve said, oh, I, I, I'm now interested in biology. How about uh, we do something in, you know, biological research, biophysics? <laughs> and uh, I don't know much about biology at all. And I just said, well, why not? Let's do that. So sometimes things, you know, happen randomly and you don't plan for that. And uh, as I got into it, and I have to say that it just fascinates me because uh, in biology, there's so many things that are unknown. You know, it's like a, it's just like a treasure island, you know, lots and lots of things waiting to be discovered. And uh, it's so fascinating that, uh, you know, I just got into it and... Uh, and the rest is history, as they say. <laughs> so that must have been interesting. I, I will tell you, I'm resonating with what you're saying, because um, when I was going through my experience of getting excited about science, I thought biology was like way too messy. And I like physics and I like chemistry. My PhD is in physical chemistry. My research was in quantum mechanics. It was pretty much all mathematics. And the idea of getting into biology, it just seemed a little scary because it was gonna be so complicated. And it is, by the way, that was not a misunderstanding. But also, as you said, it's just full of this incredible potential. So when you made this sort of leap uh, from physics into biology, was there a little bit of it like, wow, this is just like really different. I can't just use some reasoning here to sort this out. This is like uncharted territory. Did it feel that way? Yeah, it really felt like there were just so many major important questions and the uh, waiting to be answered and uh, you don't have to think hard to sort of identify an important question it's just full of important questions you know our body is just still so mysterious to us and right. uh, it, it it has a great feeling of uh, it's a gold mine for you to dig so not an easy mine for you to dig but it is a really great you know uh great gold mine to dig so indeed so of all the nuggets uh, in the gold mine uh Zawe, you migrate in the direction and have done amazing work in imaging why imaging what was the what was the draw there that took you in that direction you could have been a geneticist and you sort of are by the way but imaging was apparently the thing that really attracted you yeah so as we often say, seeing is believing, right? So <laughs> imaging allows you to see things directly, which really provides a 
truly compelling way of making discoveries. And also, you know, there's another important aspect, you know, different people using different ways to make discovery. And what I felt like is when I see something amazing, it, it brings me a truly remarkable feeling. And I still remember some of those, uh, you know, moments during the early stage of my career that got me hooked in imaging. You know, for example, as I said, I was a postdoc in Steve Chu's lab. And I were, when I first saw those single molecules under a microscope, you know, they're like twinkling stars in the night sky, you know, so mesmerizingly beautiful that uh, till today, I still remember, you know, the, 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 the feeling of uh, how amazed I was. And another such moment I can give you, uh, sort of soon after I started my lab at uh, Harvard, and we got excited about looking directly inside the cells. And one of our first project is to study how viruses invade cells. Well, a fitting subject today. <laughs> so, yeah. so at that time, you know, we labeled these viruses with fluorescent dyes and added them to mammalian cells and watched them under, you know, using the imaging setup that we built. And then we see these viruses moving inside the cell, you know, dancing around and zipping through from the cell periphery to the perinuclear region and a rapid and directed movement on microtubules, uh, you know, releasing its genetic material by fusing with the endosomes, giving a burst of signal. It's an amazing movie to watch. I got so excited. I keep showing people that movie. So, uh, so <laughs> you know, these were the moments that just got me fascinated and, and hooked with imaging. You know, it really feels great that we can see these tiny things invisible to our naked eye, you know, so clearly visible through our imaging instrument. You know, it's a really great way of making discovery. You know, as wow. Yugi Berra said, you can observe a lot by just watching, you know? <laughs> Thank you, Yogi. <laughs> so, and you not only were observing, you were observing at a level of resolution, just in terms of ability to see objects that people hadn't really been able to see with the light microscope before. Uh, there was this sense uh, over many decades, maybe centuries, that there was a limit in terms of exactly how much you could see in terms of microscopic detail because of the diffraction limit of light. And people would have said, well, that's just the way it is. And if you want to see something that's a finer detail, you've got to go to something else like electron microscopy. But you weren't satisfied with that. So, <laughs> and and that, that's a big leap to say that something that seems like a law of physics that's providing a barrier is maybe something you could work around. So how did you get that idea? And explain a little bit about how this field of super resolution microscopy has been able to achieve things that I wouldn't have thought possible. Yeah, so like you said, uh... It's a field, and then it's not just us. So, you know, I, I will explain to you our methods, the, the storm method, uh, you know, briefly. But I, uh, I would also like to uh, take this chance uh, to give a uh, general introduction of the field because uh, it's a field that a lot of people have uh, made contributions to develop methods, and even more people have used these methods to make biological discoveries. Mm -hmm. so, so I won't just focus on our own field, if, uh, I mean, our own uh, work, if that's, if, if that's okay with you. That's so, entirely okay, and it's very generous <laughs> of you, and it's a good example of how scientists should behave, where we look across and see what our colleagues are doing and not just our own work. Thank you for all that. Right. All right, so then, uh, <laughs> You mentioned diffraction limit. So uh, let me first start describing it a little bit so that we can sort of the, set the stage for these various uh, super resolution imaging methods that overcome the diffraction limit. And so the diffraction limit was uh, discovered by Ernst Abbey 150 years ago. And basically because uh, light is a wave, it's subject to diffraction. So when you focus it through light, you get a focal spot that has finite size. And even with the best objective in the world, the focal spot still has a finite size of about 200 or so nanometers. So what that means is if you image a 
even a tiny object, no matter how small it is, even an infinitesimally small point, the image still has a finite size of 200 nanometer. That's why this image profile is also called point spread function. And now when two objects are close, uh, their distance being smaller than the width of the point spread function, their images would overlap so substantially that we can no longer resolve them. So to break this limit, we need to overcome the overlapping problem. And now we actually have several approaches uh, to overcome this limit. For example, we can use patterned light illumination and nonlinear optical processes to reduce the point spread function, uh, as in stimulated emission depletion microscopy or STED and saturated structure illumination microscopy. Now we can also use single molecule switching and localization approach to overcome this limit. So here, what we do is we add a fourth dimension you know, the time dimension to help solve the problem. So at any time, we only switch on a small fraction of molecules so that their images no longer overlap. Then we can pinpoint their position uh, with a, uh, such a high precision that is uh, much better than the diffraction limit, meaning by finding the center spot of the image. And then we can turn these molecules off, turn on a different subset, localize them, iterate this process until we determine all the molecular positions and then we can put these positions together to reconstruct the image. Then the image wow. is no longer having a resolution limited by diffraction. And it's actually just limited by how precise we can localize the, the, the molecules. And the methods like palm and storm falls into this category. And, uh, and you can even not just use switching, you can use binding and unbinding to achieve this goal of localizing a subset of molecules at a time like paint. And nowadays, we could even use non-optical methods. We can expand the sample to a much bigger size uh, so that molecules originally separated by you know, distance smaller than the diffraction limit are now separated by distance bigger than the diffraction limit so that we could resolve it by conventional microscopy as mm -hmm. in expansion <clears throat> microscopy. So the list is long and growing. <laughs> And yeah. the resolution continues to improve. And now we can even achieve, you know, single digit nanometer resolution. And recently developed method called MinFlux can achieve one nanometer resolution. Whoa. So it's so this it's just really opens a, up uh, yeah, it opens up an entirely new window then of looking at cellular structures that used to be kind of a bit of a blur, and that was about it. <laughs> That's now right. you can actually see what's there. So, it, you, so what's you said, that like? Oh, you know, you, you said that exactly right. That, uh, you know, the, the, the reason why it is important is because biomolecules are small. You know, like proteins are often several nanometers in size. They mm -hmm. can form these functional structures that are so small. And then uh, very often, if we use conventional light microscopy, you use the word blur. Indeed, they're, 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 they're just a blur. And uh, if you use uh, super resolution imaging to look at it, all of a sudden that blur turned into a crisp image where you can see the interactions much better and then you can have a much better understanding of the functional mechanism because the structure function are you know often related right so and you've discovered some completely new structures we didn't know were there like something you i think called the mps in an axon which just hadn't been noticed <laughs> is there a long list of those now of cellular structures that have emerged because of super resolution that nobody actually knew about there are structures uh, that uh, people discovered. There are also systems uh, that we already know the structure, but the molecular inner works are less known. And then with the super resolution, now we can have a clearer view and then you can get better insights of you know, how these fun uh, structures function. So there are both categories. But like you said, you know, when you use super resolution, to discover a new structure that you didn't even know existed before, it really is a pleasant surprise, a really you know, very rewarding feeling like this uh, 
MPS structure that we uh, discovered yeah. before. So, uh, I mean, we discovered, I mean, it's, it's so surprising. I can tell you that well, we were just interested at that time to look at acting in synapses because acting is considered important for synaptic function or synaptic plasticity. And we just quickly turn away from synapses because we observed this beautiful period, periodic pattern of acting in axons. And, uh, you know, it, it was not known before because uh, the acting form these ring-like structures, uh, you know, uh, underneath uh, the, uh, the, uh, the axonal membrane, uh, uh, sort of around the cir uh, circumference of the axons, but they're evenly spaced. And then the spacing, about 180 nanometers, just shy of the diffraction limit. So it's smaller than the diffraction limit. So if you use a conventional microscope to see the structure, again, use your word, it's a blur. <laughs> But using store, we clearly see this periodic pattern. And then we just got drawn into it and then figured out that this pattern is because of acting rings connected by spectrum tetramers. And, uh, and then so on and so forth. Later on, we and other labs have made more and more discoveries about the structure and its function. It's, uh, it's really a uh, remarkable feeling. And it's, it's my favorite example of uh, how super resolution imaging proves to Yugi Barris, you know, saying of you can observe, observe a lot by uh, just watching. With new eyes. And, with you know, new eyes. With a, you provided know, those. Of, yeah, with a new set of eyes. <sighs> you know, indeed, super resolution imaging enabled uh, uh, other discoveries and provided new insights into so many biomolecular systems. Uh, and I won't time to enumerate them all here. It's just uh, uh, a remarkable, like, booming field. Indeed. Well, tell me um, a little more about another area that you've worked on, uh, which is genome scale imaging, where you're looking at actual gene expression, which everybody's interested in, because that kind of tells you what a cell is up to. And what you really like to know is what's a single cell doing and what, uh, what RNAs is it actually expressing? And You've come up with a way that I'm still trying to understand uh, to be able <laughs> to look at maybe more than 10,000 different RNAs in the same cell, which I would have thought there's no way you have that many labels. So how does that work? Yeah, so I think you're referring to uh, the Murfish method. I am indeed referring to Murfish, <laughs> although I've forgotten what it stands for. All right. So... Uh... So let me explain uh, that a little bit, but then later on, I will also say that uh, uh, the genome scale imaging also has some multiple different approaches. So, so I will expand from there to other approaches. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. actually, let me start by saying this so that uh, you know we uh, don't forget that it is a field, active field, that there are many researchers uh, making contributions, you know, like, like super resolution uh, imaging. If you want to achieve genome scale imaging, meaning that image uh, uh, molecules at the genomic scale, thousands of them, how do you achieve them? You can also achieve them by multiple different approaches. And then if I use RNA as an example, and uh, how do we achieve single cell transcriptome imaging? You know, one, there are two major categories of approaches. And uh, one category is using in situ sequencing. And then there's actually a number of innovative in situ sequencing methods that have been developed, uh, uh, such as ISS, Physique, you know, Star Map, and the list goes on. And uh, there's another category of approaches uh, called multiplexed fish. Uh, FISH stands for fluorescence in situ hybridization. There are also different multiplex FISH method being developed, uh, such as MERFISH and SeekFISH. So then with that backdrop, I will go into tell you the background, and then uh, I will go into tell you exactly what MERFISH is, because it's a really cool method. And uh, it's a uh, method uh, that massively multiplex single molecule FISH. And the uh, and the single molecule fish is a method that allows us to image individual RNA molecules uh, with hybridization probes. 
and localize them and count the copy number. And then if you want to image multiple different kinds of RNA molecules, you use multicolor imaging. And if you want to use that, if you want to image thousands of them, like you said, I don't have thousands of colors, right? What do you do? And the other way of thinking is I can image one at a time. Uh, I image, I extinguish the thing, signal, I label another kind, I image, I do it a thousands of times. Oh, and then and the cell's really, the cell's really dead by then. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's like a definitely not really uh, practical. So, so how do we, uh, you know, achieve genome scale imaging? Now imagine you can barcode the RNA molecules. Say so we, uh, for example, we assign binary barcodes to the molecules. Each uh, gene has a distinct barcode, okay? Uh, one, zero, one, zero, and so on. And in the first round, we label and image those genes that the first bit reads one, but not zero, and uh, extinct sig the signal. And then in the second round, we label and image those RNAs, their second bit reads one, but not zero, and an extinct the signal. And then we can sort of, after n rounds of imaging, you can do the math and calculate uh, how many different kinds of genes now you can distinguish. Oh, first of all, imagine that we're still doing single molecule imaging, okay? So after n rounds of imaging, we see many, many single molecules, many, many dots inside the R, uh, cell. And each dot has a string of binary barcodes associated with uh, one, zero, one, zero. Mm -hmm. And then you ask after n bit imaging or n rounds of imaging, how many different RNAs you can distinguish? Two to the nth. It exactly. is that exponential <clears throat> power that is so powerful and great that allow us to identify thousands of RNAs or thousands of genes with relatively few rounds of imaging. So what, 15 or 16 rounds, something like that, and you pretty much looked at the transcriptome, huh? Exactly, with 16, you calculated right. To two to the 16, <laughs> more than 60,000 is the whole transcriptome. But I yeah. have to say that there, there is a challenge. So we typically cannot get to the whole transcriptome with 16 rounds of imaging. And the challenge is because uh, uh, error accumulation. Per oh. bit imaging, there's very small error, but the error accumulates, okay? So you need redundancy, right? So exactly, we need actually what we call error robustness, or we need barcodes that can actually detect error and correct error. That's how we solved this error accumulation problem. And that's why we call the approach multiplexed uh, error robust uh, fluorescence in situ hybridization. Ah, or okay. That's the ER. Okay, got it. <laughs> but so like this... I said, you know, in 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 the in 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 the as in the case of super resolution imaging, genome scale imaging is also a field that has been established through the effort of a number of labs. So mm -hmm. while I feel fortunate to receive the prize, uh, I feel the prize actually recognized the advances uh, in these fields, not just effort in my lab. And this presumably is now being put into the efforts to define the human cell atlas, uh, where we are trying to understand just how many different human cell types are there. How do you know what's a different cell type? Well, look at its transcriptome. That would be a good place to start. And of course, a lot of people are doing this more with static analyses. My lab does a lot of single cell RNA-seq, but we don't actually get to see what that looks like terms of where those transcripts are located. So that takes you to a whole nother level. Is this scalable? Is it the sort of thing where you could imagine doing this on large numbers of human cells uh, to begin to play out some higher version understanding of what the cell atlas for the human body should look like? Yeah, absolutely. It is a scalable approach. So we can uh, really image millions in, you know, of cells or even more, you know, than, you know, for, for some of the regions or tissue types, uh, uh, tissue regions, you know, we, we focus in the brain, you know, for, for some certain brain regions, uh, we often image uh, hundreds of thousands of cells or millions of cells. And of right. course, you could imagine that uh, if you have, uh, uh, keep developing the approach or uh, having multiple labs working on it, uh, then it is a pretty scalable approach 
that allow you to really look into large tissue volumes. And as you said, uh, a lot of the labs uh, do this by uh, sequencing-based approach, uh, such as uh, single cell RNA sequencing or single cell epigenomic sequencing. These are absolutely powerful approaches that allow you to identify new cell types and then study the molecular basis of them. Uh, but the imaging-based approach offers uh, some additional uh, merits, and uh, that's because uh, we can actually use imaging-based uh, single-cell genomics approaches to image intact tissues. We don't have to dissociate cells from tissues. And then we can profile the gene expression of individual cells in intact tissues, identify mm -hmm. the cell type that allow us to directly map out the spatial organization of different types of cells in tissues. And that gives you the uh, spatially resolved cell atlas uh, you know, uh, of tissues. Right. And then the spatial organization is often important for tissue function. Oh, incredibly so. I mean, think about the brain. It'd be great to have a cell atlas, but to have a cell where you know what's neighboring to what. <laughs> That's exactly, where, you really you know, where they are located, how yeah. they interact, uh, What's their, you know, local environment, you know, things like that. And, and, and they're very complementary, the sequencing-based approaches and imaging-based approaches. Mm -hmm. And uh, I should also say that in the spatial genomics area, there's not just imaging-based approaches. There are also these approaches that you capture the RNA in a spatially resolved way and then sequence them as in uh, spatial transcriptomics or slice seq and so on. So these are all complementary approaches that hopefully will give us uh, a spatially resolved cell atlas uh, of various tissues. And they, you know, sequencing-based approach and imaging-based approach has already been used together, helping each other in a complementary way to study a variety of different tissues like the brain, the heart, developmental em uh, development embryos, and so on. So yeah. it's just a remarkably rapidly expanding, exploding field. It, all of that. I mean, 10 years ago, could I have imagined that this kind of technology would be actually available? It would be applied at scale as we begin to sort out something like the brain? Oh, my gosh. It's come along very quickly and probably much more to come. Uh, and that's the way it should be. And uh well, let me, I, we probably need to uh, wind this up. I could talk to you for hours. <laughs> yeah, I imagine <laughs> the people listening to this are like, okay, how long is this going to go? So uh, let me just ask you a couple more final questions. First of all, congratulations to you on this Lurie Prize. And I know, uh, Zawei, you have won a number of other significant prizes, like the Breakthrough Prize in, in 2019. Uh, what about the Lurie Prize? What does this mean to you? Is this like uh, one more to sort of put on your CV, or is it something? Like <laughs> well, it, it's, it, it, it is really a truly great honor to win the Lurie Prize. So. Uh, I would say that it not only means a lot to me, it also means a lot to my lab members. And as we all know, these uh, young graduate students and postdocs, yeah. they are the true heroes behind the success of a lab, right? And yeah. I think the prize honors them too. But moreover, as I mentioned, uh, we're not the only lab working in super resolution imaging or genome scale imaging. In both areas, there are other labs who make great contributions uh, to the development of uh, powerful approaches and even more labs uh, using these approaches to make biological discoveries. Uh, so I think the prize uh, also recognizes uh, these exciting fields uh, and the many scientists working in these fields and recognize their contribution to biomedical sciences. And that's, again, I think a wonderful way uh, to talk about why prizes matter. It's always tempting, I think, for people to focus in on the person, but usually it's the person who's part of a community. That's how science works. So, so finally, let me ask you, if there was a young person who's listening to this and maybe thinking about what they want to do with their own career and maybe contemplating uh, getting into biomedical research, what would you say uh, to that person about their opportunities right now? Well, I would say it's a really exciting time to get into biomedical research. And uh, there are many new and uh, interdisciplinary approaches that have made this already important and exciting field just even more exciting now. 
So for young people who are trained with a biological background, uh, I would like to encourage that you keep your eyes and mind open for these new cross-disciplinary approaches uh, so that you can harness their power for your research too. But also for people who are not trained as a biologist, as I was not trained as a biologist, right? As you know. So uh, if you're interested in biomedical research, don't be afraid of getting into this new territory because your background uh, training in physical sciences uh, in, or computation or engineering or other areas uh, could give you a special aid edge, I'm sorry, <laughs> a special edge that allow you to invent new approaches to tackle biomedical problems that were not previously accessible. And uh, that would enable a new, whole new set of discoveries. So it's, it's just a remarkable, exciting time. And uh, you know, for young people to go into biomedical science. That's a perfect answer and certainly resonates uh, with me that we're in this sort of golden age of discovery for life sciences. And congratulations to you for the contributions you have made to that golden age already. And I guess there's going to be a lot more to come. I'd be willing uh, to bet there are things you're going to be doing over the next uh, 20 or 30 years that you and I and nobody else has quite thought of yet and what an amazing time it is to be part of those kinds of adventures. So one more time, congratulations, Zhao Wei, uh, and thank you for explaining all of this uh, in this uh, brief conversation. I really enjoyed it, and really glad that the Alluri Prize folks uh, came up with such a great selection for 2021, regardless of COVID-19. Someday, I hope uh, you and I'll be in the same place, and we can have an even longer conversation, because I'd love to hear more. But thank you very much for your work and congratulations. Well, thank you, Francis, for this great and fun conversation. And then I also would like to take this uh, chance to thank uh, uh, Anne Lurie and uh, the Foundation for NIH again for establishing this uh, prize to honor uh, scientists. Here, here. Good evening, everyone. What a terrific interview that was. I'm Ann Lurie, and I'm delighted to honor another groundbreaking scientist with the Lurie Prize in Biomedical Sciences. Nine years ago, I began the journey of recognizing exceptional biomedical researchers with the Lurie Prize in partnership with the FNIH. It's been a unique and gratifying experience to hear the details of groundbreaking discoveries made by these scientists and to recognize their work across a broader audience, work that will ultimately benefit the health of humanity. I wish to take a moment to salute our distinguished jury led by jury chair and FNIH board member, Dr. Saul Snyder. Thank you, Saul, and all jury members for your unwavering dedication to the Lurie Prize in the biomedical sciences. Now it is with great honor that we next present the 2021 Lurie Prize to Dr. Xiaowei Shuang. We are thrilled to bestow you with the 2021 Lurie Prize for your transformational research that has made the invisible visible through the invention of STORM. Among you and your team's many accomplishments, you have allowed us to see never before seen structures in nerve cells in the human brain. Dr. Shuang, I offer my warmest congratulations to you. And now, Dr. Shuang. Well, thank you, Anne, for establishing this prize to honor biomedical scientists and for presenting me this great honor. It's my uh, truly great pleasure to accept this prize. As I mentioned during the conversation with uh, Dr. Francis Collins, uh, this prize honors not only me, but also my uh, former and current lab members and also others uh, who work in these exciting fields. So we're truly honored. Thank you. 
Again, congratulations, Dr. Zhuang, and thank you for your contributions. Four years ago, the FNIH launched the Trailblazer Prize for clinician scientists. The Trailblazer Prize is generously funded by a donation from Drs. John and Elaine Gallen, both change makers in the field of medicine themselves. John, as former director of the NIH Clinical Center, Elaine, as a research physiologist and partner in philanthropic organizations funding biomedical research. This prize recognizes and celebrates the outstanding contributions of early career clinician scientists whose research translates basic scientific observations into new paradigm shifting approaches for diagnosing, preventing, treating, or curing disease and disability. We are honoring three finalists tonight from whom one will be announced as the winner of the Trailblazer Prize. To tell you about these stellar scientists, I turn it over to Elaine and John. Thank you, Frida. My name is John Gallen, and good evening, everyone. We are delighted to celebrate the outstanding achievements of the three Trailblazer finalists and announce the recipient of the fourth annual Trailblazer Prize for Clinician Scientists as part of the 2021 FNIH award ceremony. I'm Dr. Elaine Gallen. My husband John's work over four decades at the NIH Clinical Center, as well as my past efforts funding clinical investigators at the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, underlie our view that the critical role of clinician scientists needs to be better understood and celebrated. We've been privileged to work with many talented and innovative clinical scientists over the years. They conduct research that applies basic scientific knowledge to clinical problems, ultimately moving scientific discovery from the laboratory bench to the bedside and applying their findings to patient care. Through the Trailblazer Prize, we are raising awareness of the essential medical contributions of early career clinical investigators and highlighting their unique and critical role. In short, by celebrating the extraordinary contributions of a few individuals, we hope to ensure that they remain committed to this work and also to encourage the entrance of new talent into this important field. In a moment, you will get to hear about the impressive work of the three Trailblazer Prize finalists, selected from an extraordinary pool of nominees by a very distinguished jury of seven biomedical research leaders, chaired by Dr. Michael Welsh. The finalists' work spans the fields of leukemia, mutant protein-driven cancers, such as pancreatic, colon, lung, thyroid, and ovarian cancers, and skin conditions, such as atopic dermatitis. These early career clinician scientists are being recognized for their outstanding research contributions, which have already led to important in innovations in patient care. We are delighted to introduce the following three remarkable finalists. Dr. Ian Miles, Chief Epithelial Therapeutics Unit in the Laboratory of Clinical Immunology and Microbiology in the Division of Intramural Research at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, or NIAID, at NIH. Dr. Miles is being recognized for his exploration of the skin condition, atopic dermatitis, allergy, and microbial dysbiosis, an imbalance of the body's microbial communities that cause inflammation. His work has led to the development of the first in-human trial of topical microbiome transplantation using Rosimonas mucosa in treating atopic dermatitis. Dr. Courtney DiNardo, Associate Professor, Department of Leukemia in the Division of Cancer Medicine at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Dr. DiNardo is being recognized for her innovative research into acute leukemia involving evaluation of novel small molecules and targeted therapeutics, which has led to three new FDA-approved acute myeloid leukemia or AML therapies. 
Dr. DiNardo is also the founder of the MD Anderson Cancer Center Hereditary Leukemia Clinic for the Detection of Inherited Cancer Predispositions. Dr. Piero Lito, Assistant Professor of Medicine, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, Weill Medical College of Cornell University, who's being recognized for catalyzing breakthroughs in the understanding of oncoprotein signaling and the development of novel therapeutic approaches for cancers driven by the mutant CRAS protein. Dr. Lito's fundamental research directly translates to patients, and he served as one of the principal investigators of the first in human clinical trial testing the effect of CRAS G12C inhibitors, work that helped establish the first FDA approved CRAS directed therapy for lung cancer patients. We'll first hear from Dr. Courtney DiNardo. Well, thank you everyone so much. It's my privilege to be here uh, with you all virtually today. I'm Courtney DiNardo. I am at MD Anderson Cancer Center um, in the Department of Leukemia. And I think it's just so amazing what has taken place in really in all of cancer, but it, but in my world, in the treatment of patients with acute leukemias over the past couple of years, I mean, there's just been a transformation in our scientific understanding of leukemia, as well as our ability to treat acute leukemia. So it has been, you know, decades and decades that we had kind of a standard intensive chemotherapy option and a lower intensity palliative type option for patients who couldn't get intensive chemotherapy. And that was really the only two options that we had. Um, and over, you know, over the past decade with, with the understanding of, of the underlying genetic underpinnings of cancer, we've realized that AML is just it is so many different leukemias. It's not just one size fits all treatment. And so I have been very fortunate to be involved in many different um, uh, targeted treatment uh, trials um, where we have now been able to essentially kind of turn all of AML into, you know, multiple different um, pieces of, of, of one pie where, you know, patients with an IDH1 mutation can now be treated with a targeted IDH1 inhibitor. IDH2 mutated patients can now be treated with an IDH2 inhibitor. And I've been part of kind of the development of that pathway over like a seven year period from not even knowing that IDH mutations existed to then developing targeted therapy, getting it through the clinic, and then leading to an FDA approval so people can um, uh, can benefit from these therapies. Um, and then I've also been involved in the development of a, um, uh, of a small molecule called Phenetoclex, which is um, a, uh, a really effective therapy in combination with a, our standard hypomethylating agents. Um, and so this combination has really revolutionized the treatment of our older patients who aren't candidates for the really aggressive intensive chemotherapy we option. And it has just really changed the standard of care so that patients who um, unfortunately didn't used to have kind of really any significant hope of, of long-term disease-free survival, we, we are dramatically um, surpassing and changing our expectations. And, um, and I think that's just, it's, um, it's, it's the theme across all cancer and all medicine specialties. It's just the, the information that we are receiving, these scientific advances are really translating now into improved outcomes for our patients. And it's just been my honor to be part of these uh, innovative trials that are changing um, the, the outcomes of, of patients. And I just wanna thank you all so much for recognizing me in, in this fashion and, and, and thank you again. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Piero Lido. Um, hello, my name is uh, Piero Lito. I am a physician scientist at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center uh, in New York City. As a physician scientist, my time is divided between caring for patients with lung cancer and leading a research program that is focused um, on understanding how mutated proteins drive cancer cell growth. My lab is also interested in developing novel therapeutic approaches that can help treat patients with cancer. For about 21 years now, or nearly half of my life, I've been studying a protein called KRAS. Uh, this is a key protein that regulates a number of uh, different cellular functions, and it serves as a molecular switch 
and it can turn on and off the ability of cells to proliferate. Now, Keras is important because it's one of the most frequently activated proteins uh, in cancer. And uh, historically, Keras has been very difficult uh, to therapeutically target by using drugs. Now, working in parallel with uh, investigators uh, in the field, we have played a key role in establishing and helping develop uh, inhibitors or drugs that can selectively target one mutant form of Keras, which is known as Keras G12C, which is one of the most commonly found mutations uh, in lung cancer patients. So more specifically, my group uh, has helped uh, determine the mechanism of action by which these drugs function in cells. And we've also helped understand how cancer cells adapt and respond to treatment and how they become resistant to therapy. In addition, in the lab, we like to use these drugs as biochemical scalpels. Uh, and by virtue of using these drugs, we can help determine new insight about how this important cancer protein is regulated in cells. And with this knowledge, we can identify even better therapeutic approaches for, for patients. One of my most rewarding experiences as a physician scientist has been to help translate uh, these drugs into clinical trials for patients. Uh, over the past year, we found that about one third of patients with lung cancer uh, respond uh, to this uh, treatment. And these studies, coupled with uh, subsequent work, uh, have led to the approval by the FDA of uh, Keras inhibitors for the treatment of patients with Keras G12C mutant lung cancer. And this is important because this is the first Keras directed therapy uh, that has been approved in about 40 years since uh, Keras mutations were first identified in patients. And last but not least, we'll now hear from Dr. Ian Miles. My name is Ian Miles. I am the chief of the Epithelial Therapeutics Unit at the National Institutes of Health under uh, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease. The best way to describe our lab's philosophy comes from what's called the groundwater theory. In its original form, the groundwater theory is related to issues of social equity. But for us, the simple idea is to imagine you come across two different lakes. In the lake on the left, there's one dead fish floating in the water. And so when you see this, your mind is likely to wonder what's wrong with that fish. But if the lake on the right, half the fish are floating dead in the water. When you see this, your mind isn't likely to ask what genetic predispositions there are for the dead fish or what are the protective mechanisms for the survivors. Not that these predispositions are unimportant, but the first thing you will wonder is what's in the water as evidenced by the fact that you will know better than to go swimming in that lake. So from our lab's perspective, we perceive half the people in the lake of industrialization are suffering from diseases of the immune system, neurologic system, and or metabolic system. While science has uncovered the causal exposures for some of these diseases, like dietary impacts on obesity, for many of these diseases, especially the allergic diseases, the environmental triggers that directly lead to these disease, diseases are unknown and under-evaluated. While we've been working towards uncovering these exposures, we noticed, as many have, that the environment's impact on health tends to imprint on the microbiome, and thus presents a target that we might manipulate for better health. We discovered a strain of normal bacteria that comes from the skin called Rosimonas mucosa that in cell cultures, mice, and now human clinical trials appears to improve mechanisms and symptoms of atopic germ after topical application. The most exciting potential for this treatment is the chance to actually change the course of the disease since the bacteria can colonize the patients and therefore continue to provide aid even after the treatment has stopped. And this is exactly what you hear when you talk to the patients and families dealing with eczema. Their main hope isn't that someone will make a better version of the drugs or lotions they already have to take or apply every day. Rather, they are hoping that someone will find a way to remove not only the burden of disease, but also the burden of their treatment frequency, cost, and side effects. In addition to work on atopic derm, we are looking into what the normal metabolic processes are for everyday repair of the skin. We hope uh, that learning how the skin deals with normal wear and tear will teach us how this process goes wrong and could be improved. So overall, while we continue to work towards assessing the clinical uh, validity of Rosimonas as a treatment, we are using the bacteria's physiology to help guide us towards uncovering whatever it is that's in the water, so to speak, 
um, perhaps quite literally, although for us, it could also be in the air. So thank you again for your nomination. Thank you, Dr. Doctors Donardo, Lito, and Miles for your remarkable achievements. And congratulations to all of you for your outstanding contributions. We look forward to hearing more about you and your exceptional accomplishments in the future. And now <clears throat> we are pleased to announce that the winner of the 2021 Trailblazer Prize for Clinician Scientists is Dr. Piero Lito. Congratulations. Uh, thank you very much, Drs. Elaine and John Gallen. I'm very uh, happy to be the recipient of the 2021 Trailblazer Prize by the Foundation of the National Institutes of Health. Uh, this is a great honor and a tremendous recognition, not only for my work, but uh, also for the work that I've done in collaboration with a group of amazing uh, physicians and scientists at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And this includes uh, the amazing members of my laboratory who have been working uh, tirelessly over the past several years, but also my uh, clinical colleagues in the thoracic oncology service, uh, without whose help we would not be able to effectively translate uh, these inhibitors uh, into clinical practice, at least at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Uh, I also like to acknowledge our collaborators from uh, outside institutions. Their help has been tremendous in our efforts as well. And I truly hope and believe that this recognition will uh, only uh, further our conviction and determination to continue studying KERAS and to develop even more and improved therapeutics uh, that can be translated uh, to the treatment of patients uh, uh, in the clinic. Uh, thank you again, and I'm tremendously honored by this recognition. Thank you to the finalists, and congratulations again, Dr. Leto. The Charles A. Sanders MD Partnership Award is a tribute to over-the-top collaboration and contribution. Named in honor of Charlie Sanders, who not only chaired the board of the FNIH with passion and dedication for many years, but who also served as chairman and CEO of Glaxo, as well as general director of the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, professor of medicine at Harvard, and is of course a member of the Institute of Medicine at the National Academy of Sciences. This award celebrates Charlie's spirit of collaboration and honors organizations and individuals who have helped us move our mission forward. During the past year, because of the extreme situation we've suffered finding our way out of a global pandemic, and we've still a long way to go, a number of individuals in one organization have risen to the top. They have contributed over and above what would have been required of a partnership awardee in a normal year, but these are not normal times. I'll let David and Steve tell you more about them. Well, I'm delighted now to present the Charles A. Sanders MD Partnership Award this evening. First, let me share a few words on behalf of Dr. Sanders, who preceded me as the board chair of the FNIH and is the founder of the Partnership Award. Since its establishment 25 years ago, the FNIH has become a leader in forging powerful public-private partnerships that advance biomedical research. The 2021 Partnership Award recognizes two remarkable groups that have made significant contributions to the FNIH's work in support of the mission of the National Institutes of Health. I am grateful to our awardees for their dedication to scientific collaboration aimed at a common goal, advancing breakthrough biomedical research discoveries and improving the quality of people's lives. Thank you all. The Partnership Award recipients are nominated by the FNIH staff, recognizing individuals or organizations that have proven to be exemplary partners. Former recipients have included, among others, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Dr. Anthony Fauci. This year, we have the pleasure of presenting the Partnership Award to multiple recipients. The research and development arm of a leading global pharmaceutical company, Janssen, 
and the eight co-chairs of the working groups of ACTIVE. ACTIVE stands for Accelerating COVID-19 Therapeutic Interventions and Vaccines, a public-private partnership led by the NIH and coordinated by the FNIH that launched in April of 2020. It has played a critical role in accelerating the timelines for bringing COVID-19 therapeutics and vaccines to the global stage. Representing Janssen tonight, we have Alex Gorski, Chairman and CEO of Johnson & Johnson here with us this evening. Janssen Research and Development has been an exemplary partner and leader across many FNIH projects and programs, including ACTIVE. Several Accelerating Medicine Partnerships or AMP programs, the Biomarkers Consortium, and many projects carried out under that umbrella the Partnership for Accelerating Cancer Therapies, PACT, and the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative, or ADNI, among others. In their scientific leadership roles, Janssen scientists have consistently promoted a highly collegial, collaborative approach to problem solving, with emphasis on teamwork and transparent communication that enables open pre-competitive science. I would like to take just a moment to acknowledge my FL, FNIH uh, board member and the chief scientific officer of J&J, &J, Dr. Paul Stoffels, who despite an incredibly demanding job has provided much good advice, leadership and support of the FNIH. I cannot emphasize enough how deeply and appreciative we are of Janssen's willingness to partner with us in the name of advancing pre-competitive science and public health across so many critical groundbreaking projects. From the bottom of our hearts, thank you. Hello everyone and thank you. It's really an incredible honor to accept the Dr. Charles A. Sanders Partnership Award from the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health. At Johnson & Johnson, we firmly believe that today's health challenges cannot be solved by any single organization, institution, or government. And that's why I'm so proud that the work we've done building, implementing, and nurturing public-private partnerships is being recognized here today. Because when we share knowledge and resources and bring together broad networks and talents to fuel new ideas, well, we can achieve remarkable things. The NIH's active initiative is a great example of just this kind of collaboration. It fosters unparalleled levels of partnership among public health organizations, academic institutions, and biopharmaceutical companies just like Johnson & Johnson to defeat the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, I'd also like to thank a true champion of human health, Dr. Francis Collins for his exceptional leadership in accelerating the development of new vaccines, medicines, and diagnostics for combating COVID-19. I believe one of the true silver linings of this pandemic has been the ability to see the good that can happen when we collaborate broadly for the benefit of all humanity. If we continue to build on this momentum, I truly believe that there is no challenge, no challenge too great for us to take on. So on behalf of everyone at Johnson & Johnson, thank you. Thank you again for the honor of this prestigious award. Now, David will join us to present the next partnership award. Accelerating COVID-19 Therapeutic Interventions and Vaccines, or ACTIVE, has involved the efforts of over 100 scientists from multiple government agencies, and 20 pharmaceutical biotechnology and nonprofit organizations over the last 18 months. These scientists were organized into four working groups that helped design and execute our national strategy for combating COVID-19 at unprecedented speed. The eight co-chairs of the four working groups spent countless hours working individually and in partnership with their scientific colleagues to select, develop, and test new treatments to address the global pandemic. They somehow did this 
while working full time at their regular jobs and caring for their families and loved ones. The success of Active is very much due to their efforts and their leadership. Let me introduce this dream team by name. Christine Colvis, Director of Drug Development Partnership Programs at the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences at NIH. Thank you. Betsy DeRosier, Executive Director of Clinical Sciences and Study Management at Merck. Thank you. Eric Hughes, formerly Global Head of Clinical Development and Analytics at Novartis, now at Vertex Pharmaceuticals. Thank you. Katherine Jansen, Senior Vice President and Head of Vaccine Research and Development at Pfizer. Thank you. Mike Carilla, Director of the Division of Clinical Innovation at the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences at NIH. Thank you. Doug Lowy, a renowned virologist who just happens to do double duty as Principal Deputy Director of the National Cancer Institute at NIH. Thank you. Sarah Reed, Deputy Director of the Division of AIDS at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at NIH. Thank you. John Young, Global Head of Infectious Diseases and Vice President at Roche. Thank you. And now you will hear some words directly from these wonderful awardees themselves. Well, it's such an honor to receive this award. I wanna thank Dr. Sanders, Dr. Paul, and the other members of the committee for this recognition. Last spring, when we realized that we were at the beginning of a pandemic, FNIH sprang into action and they assembled active in a way that only FNIH could. Serving as the co-chair of the preclinical working group of ACTIVE has been a great privilege and an incredible experience. And while FNIH is bestowing this honor, it was FNIH that led the complex coordination that was essential to the program. And in particular, I wanna thank Dr. Joe Minetsky, who led the coordination of the preclinical working group and our subgroups. And I'm very grateful to have been paired with Dr. John Young from Roche, with whom I served as co-chair. The working group itself left me humbled by the insightful discussions and the unwavering commitment of its members. Some of the working group members were also frontline workers and they would occasionally report what they were seeing. Those reports kept our charge to find treatments front and center and it inspired us to push through the exhaustion that we were all feeling and to go as fast as we could to try to find them some relief. To all frontline workers, we owe more than we can ever pay back. And I'm grateful that I had the opportunity to play a small part to try to help. It was truly an honor. And I received this award tonight with immense gratitude and humility. Thank you. I would like to thank the FNIH and the awards committee for this great honor, which I accept on behalf of the entire active preclinical working group and the many external scientific and clinical experts that we engaged with over the past 18 months. It was a real honor for me to serve as a co-chair of this group. We came together at the start of the pandemic with our sleeves rolled up and a can-do attitude, applying our deep scientific knowledge and rigor to ensure that only the most promising COVID-19 therapeutics were prioritized for testing with limited preclinical resources. We also provided support for those agents that were rapidly progressed into active clinical trials. In addition, we established a number of open access resources to educate the community about important aspects of research and development in this rapidly emerging disease area. The group worked tirelessly towards these goals, and I wish to thank everyone involved for this tremendous effort. I also would like to thank Dr. Collins, David Wally, the NIH and FNIH leaderships, and the active leadership for the trust that they placed in us. A big thank you also to Joe Minetsky of the FNIH for his outstanding commitment and leadership in advancing our mission and to the team at Deloitte for providing truly excellent logistical and meeting support. 
Thank you. Thank you. It's a real honor to be awarded the Charles A. Sanders Partnership Award from the FNIH. Um, you know, this work that we did in active on the clinical therapeutics group was really a silver lining in this entire year and a half during this crazy pandemic. Um, and it was a, such a good experience because of the people I worked with, including uh, Sarah Reed, who was my co-lead, and uh, Stacy Adams, who was our FNIH a representative on the team and the entire team of scientists. This was really a collaborative effort. I, the, the spirit of the team to really focus on driving great science with a patient always in mind was really heartwarming during the entire year. And the amount of work that was achieved by the group was really uh, amazing. And I think it's uh, something that we'll look back on and uh, hopefully recapitulate when if ever we need it again in the future. So thank you again. I will always remember this time. I appreciate being honored in such a great way, but it really is very selfish because it was more of a, a rewarding experience for me than anything else. So thank you very much. Thank you so much to the Foundation for the NIH for this recognition. It's truly an honor, and it has been an honor for the past 18 months to be part of the active public-private partnership. This partnership has brought together an extraordinary number of stakeholders with an interest in advancing vaccines and therapeutics for COVID-19. I've had the privilege of working with a large number of them in the Clinical Therapeutics Working Group and have been continually so impressed by the level of energy and commitment and generosity in terms of time, intellectual input, and resources contributed to this effort. For me, this has been a shining example of when you bring together partners with a shared goal, truly amazing things can happen. I'm proud of the accomplishments of ACTIVE and proud to have been part of such an extraordinary group. I would like to thank and recognize the vision and leadership of the NIH and of the Foundation for the NIH. Our partners in the Foundation for the NIH have been the engine driving our progress and the source of our success. It's been an inspiration and a pleasure working together. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for this award. And I'm, it's an honor to accept FNIH's 2021 Charles A. Sanders Partnership Award. And this is due to my work as one of the co-chairs on the Accelerating COVID-19 Therapeutic Interventions and Vaccines or Active Working Groups. I was fortunate to have a true partnership with my co-chair on the Clinical Trial Capacity Working Group with Michael Carrilla. We also worked very closely with Karen Tudis as an FNIH member who kept us well prepared for our meetings and on track with our deliverables. We worked with an amazing group of professionals who dedicated their time and expertise to support our working group. It was a collaboration where we all had the same goal and we shared work across team members to work with speed, agility, and I'd also say true grit. We accomplished an amazing amount of work in a short amount of time, all while doing our day jobs in various companies and organizations around the world. We should all be very proud of the accomplishments that continue with these active working groups, knowing that there's still work to be done to address the global pandemic. Just thank you again for the recognition of my activities on this team. Thank you. So it's uh, it's an honor and a privilege to uh, to be receiving the, this award from uh, the FNIH. Uh, it really represents uh, the accomplishments of a large group of people for which I am uh, eternally grateful. Uh, for their participation and their effort and and commitment, my, um, my uh, including me, my and my fellow co-chair, on this, it was a rather daunting task uh, that I thought was uh, uh, quite uh, going to be quite a difficult lift. But uh, with with the expertise and uh, time and effort that uh, members put in, it became a rather tractable. Uh, uh, approach uh, to uh, to address this critical problem and provide some uh, really uh, salient uh, tools and capabilities to the overall active effort that has really uh, uh, accelerated the the development of uh, the evaluation of of interventions and therapeutics uh, towards COVID COVID uh, the COVID pandemic. And so I'm eternally grateful for all of the effort that people have put in and uh, they, are, they are equally deserving of this award. Thank you. It is really an honor for me to accept this award, but 
it would not be possible to do so if it wasn't for the hard work of my co-chair, Catherine Jansen, but also Mike Santos from FNIH, and especially the work of the vaccine working group uh, that we were privileged to co-chair. The group came together in a way where the whole was much greater than the sum of its parts. And it really was an extraordinary opportunity that is continuing to go on today uh, for doing this. Uh, but I would be remiss if I did not especially thank Dr. Francis Collins for his exemplary uh, conception and ongoing leadership of the active uh, group in general, uh, because without his vision, this would not have existed. And his ongoing commitment to the success of active is a critical component of what made this uh, area uh, to work so well and so effectively. So thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Collins. Thank you for allowing me to be your MC this evening. It has been a pleasure. Again, congratulations to all of the awardees and to all of you, thank you for sharing the evening with us. Thank you.